Here's by far the fastest and easiest way to regularly publish papers in Q1 Scopus Index journals without working more hours, without feeling stressed or overwhelmed. Let's start with the problem that most researchers and PhD students face. Here's how a typical day of a PhD student or a researcher might look like. When you arrive at work, you chat with a few colleagues and grab another coffee. When you open your computer, there is a bunch of email notifications. So you decide to scroll through your email and maybe answer a few important messages. Then you look at your agenda and there are some meetings planned here and there and a few unfinished tasks. So you spend some time figuring out what you should focus on first. Once you finally get stuck in and start working on your first task, a colleague comes in asking for some advice. You have a chat and maybe 10 or 20 minutes pass. You try to get back to your initial task, but it's really hard to get back in the flow. Then you see an email notification pop up from your boss with a subject line that looks kind of important. So you decide to click on it and read the email. It turns out to be not that important, but again, you got distracted from the task that you were working on. Now it's 11 a.m. and your first meeting is about to start. And I could go on, but I think you get the point. An average knowledge worker, such as a PhD student or a researcher, according to numerous studies, works on average 2.3 hours a day and gets interrupted on average 20 times every day and it takes on average about 20 minutes to get back into full focus after each interruption. Research also shows that switching in between tasks such as email and writing a paper or talking to a colleague and then trying to write a paper is incredibly costly in terms of energy and your attention. That's why most researchers are constantly in between publishing and perishing, constantly playing catch up and working 50 or 60 hours every single week. 47% of researchers, according to many studies, feel constant stress. But the good news is that it doesn't have to be like this. You can publish regularly in Q1 journals while feeling relaxed, fulfilled, and while actually working less than most of your colleagues. All thanks to what Carl Newport calls deep work. Now picture this different type of day. You arrive at work and you go to your quiet, deep work spot. It's got lovely natural light coming in through big windows. No interruptions. You open up your laptop and the Word document that you're supposed to be working on pops up. There are no email notifications to distract you because you've removed all of them. You've also put your email autoresponder on and blocked your agenda in your work calendar so there are no meetings planned and people trying to contact you know that you are in your deep work mode. This puts you at ease and you're ready to dive in to your most important task. You pop binaural beats for greater focus, you read what you wrote yesterday just to warm yourself up and then you're ready to dive in and get started writing. Before you know it, you're experiencing flow. Words are coming together almost effortlessly and you kind of lose track of time. And before you know it, two hours have passed and you've written half of the introduction that you were supposed to write today. You take a quick break, looking out through the window and maybe closing your eyes for a little bit just to relax and rest a little bit. Your phone is safely locked in a drawer on airplane mode or switched off so you don't automatically pick it up to distract yourself with social media. After your 10 minute break, you feel refreshed, ready to get back in. And by 11 a.m., you've done four hours of deep work and have written more than an average PhD student or researcher typically does in a month. That's the true power of deep work. And according to Carl Newport, deep work is a state of distraction-free focus that allows you to push your abilities to the limit, producing rare and valuable work. This is in contrast to what Carl Newport terms shallow work, which is usually done in the state of destruction. It is non-cognitively demanding and adds little value to society. Think answering emails. The problem most of us as researchers or PhD students face is that most of our days are spent in shallow work and rarely do we ever enter the state of deep work. But when you look at all great minds in history, they spend significant portions of their work hours in deep work. 
For example, Carl Jung, who revolutionized psychology, was well known for retreating into his cabin in the woods for weeks to do his deep work. Similarly, Donald Knuth, a recipient of the ACM Turning Award, informally considered to be the Nobel Prize of Computer Science, went as far as getting rid of his email so that he could spend most of his days uninterrupted in the state of deep work. Now, before I explain how you can tap into the power of deep work, let's briefly talk about why deep work is so important for you as a researcher or a PhD student. The reason is simple. Academia is what Shervin Rosen called a winner-takes-all market. In other words, the top 1% of researchers will take in 99% of citations, grants, best tenure track jobs. There's simply a huge payoff to being the best in academia. And the only way to do this is to consistently produce top academic work faster than others. Take Adam Grant as an example. He was the youngest professor who got tenure and who became full professor at Wharton Business School at Penn University. He published groundbreaking papers at an unbelievably fast rate. How? Through deep work. Adam batches all his teaching in the fall, so the spring and summer are spent on research exclusively. He's also well known for putting an email autoresponder on an out-of-office note on his door whenever he's doing deep work. This allows him to really get into the flow, do deep work for prolonged periods of time uninterrupted and produce significantly more work that is significantly more valuable in the academia without working more than his colleagues. So now if you also want to beat 99% of other researchers, produce more valuable work faster without working more while feeling more relaxed and fulfilled, you really need to tap into the power of deep work. Now how do you do this? In his book deep work, Carl Newport provides four simple rules for truly tapping in and making the most out of deep work. Here's deep work rule number one, work deeply. You need to choose your deep work rhythm and then stick to it. One option of deep work is what Carl Newport calls a monastic style of deep work. This is what somebody like Donald Knuth does. It involves isolating yourself as much as possible for prolonged periods of time without interruptions on a regular basis. And as we said, Donald Knuth went as far as getting rid of his email to do this. Now, you don't necessarily have to become a monk to do deep work. You can also do deep work at scheduled intervals of time. For example, Adam Grant that we have just mentioned batches most of his teaching into one semester so that the other semesters can be in the vast majority spent on research work. He probably still engages with his students a little bit during the other semesters, but they are almost exclusively dedicated to doing research and writing papers. Now, you can also do deep work on a more daily and weekly basis and create a habitual deep work schedule. For example, you can schedule your deep work to happen three times a week, Monday, Wednesday and Friday from 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. Then as much as possible, you want to try to make a ritual out of your deep work slots. Start and finish at the same time. Do it always in the same place. Play the same music. Wear the same headphones. Use the same procedure for writing. Take breaks in the same way at the same time. For example, by always taking a 50-minute walk in the same park. Why? The more habitual, the more ritualized you make it, the easier it will be for you to get into the flow state and to actually carry out that deep work. Now, here's deep work rule number two that Carl Newport shares in his book, Deep Work. And that rule is to embrace boredom. Look, we live in a terribly distracted world that constantly bombards us with new stimuli vying for our attention, to the extent where we're no longer comfortable even with a few seconds of boredom. Just look at people standing in a queue, everybody glued to the smartphone. Look at people in the elevator. Nobody's even comfortable with 30 seconds of being in the elevator without being glued to the smartphones. What about when we take a lunch break? Again, we're glued to our smartphones scrolling through TikTok. 
And that constant stimulation ruins your ability to focus for prolonged periods of time on deep work. It also saps your attention. That's why to do deep work and make real breakthroughs as a researcher, you need to embrace boredom. In other words, you need to get comfortable with doing nothing and you need to get comfortable with completely eliminating as many stimuli as possible. For example, let your mind wander for 10 to 15 minutes while staring out of the window and taking a break from your deep work. Don't take out the phone to watch some videos on YouTube. Another idea, go on walks in the nature, again, without being glued to your phone, just walking and feeling slightly bored. So above all, let your mind be bored and cut yourself free of the constant stimulation of your phone. Here's deep work rule number three quit social media. Or at the very least, if you can't bring yourself to truly quitting all social media, delete the apps from your phone. Even though I make YouTube videos, I don't have YouTube on my phone. And on my laptop, I use a YouTube feed blocker so that I only see the search bar when I'm logged into YouTube. This is because before I would get really sucked into YouTube for hours on end. I would waste time without getting much out of it really because there was no intention with me watching YouTube. It was just kind of mindless scrolling through videos and real brain death. And the worst part, I would just feel horrible about it because I would often end up comparing myself to other people whose YouTube videos I was watching. Now, I only watch YouTube videos with a particular intention in mind. For example, to find a particular piece of information when I'm preparing my own YouTube video. That way, I never get sucked in for hours by the algorithm. I learn what I need to learn and feel good about it. So that I would really recommend. So following Carl Newport, I would also really, really recommend that if you want to do deep work regularly and beat 99% of other scientists, make truly groundbreaking work, you need to eliminate all social media. Rule number four of deep work is to drain the shallows. You might remember that shallow work refers to work usually done on autopilot, in the state of distraction, in, and is non-cognitively demanding, and adds little value, i.e. answering emails. What you need to do is ruthlessly eliminate, minimize, or delegate, automate such shallow work. The first strategy is by far the best. Just eliminate it all. If it doesn't add value, if it can be done in a state of destruction almost on an autopilot, why would you do it at all? While your brain might tell you that you cannot eliminate a lot of tasks because maybe your boss or your colleagues will get mad at you and you'll miss out on a lot of really good research opportunities, I'd encourage you to really open yourself up to the possibility that you can truly eliminate most of the shallow work that you're currently carrying out. For example, do you really, really need to be part of that faculty board and take part in these meetings? Unless you can make a unique and valuable contribution that really nobody else in your faculty can honestly make, well then, you shouldn't be part of these meetings. So just get rid of it. Now, the second strategy to drain the shallows is to minimize. There will be a limited amount of shallow work which truly cannot be eliminated. For example, email. Well, unless you're Daniel Knuth, who completely eliminated email. So what you should do with such shallow work is to compress it as much as possible to very strict, short batches of time when you will do it. Let's take email as an example. Rather than answer it at different times of day, schedule a 30 minute block once a day at the end of the day when you will answer all your emails. And if that makes you feel worried, you might even schedule an autoresponder that lets everybody know that you're answering your emails at 4.30 p.m. every single day so that everybody else feels good that you will actually answer their emails within 24 hours. And honestly speaking, you could probably do it once every three or four days because most emails in academia don't have to be answered the same day. And the third strategy to drain the shallows is to delegate or automate. Many shallow activities can be completely or almost completely automated. 
For example, you could craft an automated email response to a certain email type, for example, an email inviting you to submit an abstract to a conference that will be sent automatically provided a certain keyword appears in the subject line. You could also avoid hours of back and forth trying to schedule meetings by simply having a Calendly link that you can give people or you even put um, in your email sign off and people can click on that and book a meeting with you. And if it can't be automated, just delegate it. For example, do you really need to be spending weeks in the field collecting data? Probably not. A trained graduate student could do that for you. And once you truly commit to doing deep work, you will see how your productivity soars without actually working more. You also feel more satisfied because you'll be engaging in more meaningful work for prolonged periods of time that also positively challenges you. So now that you know how important deep work is, you might want to put it in practice and write your next paper much faster. This next video shows you how to write a paper for a Q1 journal following a proven template in just a week. So watch it next.